Oman really is the jewel of the Middle East. At the crossroad of continents with landscapes fed by a monsoon from the Indian Ocean, Oman has an incredible diversity of plants, animals and birds. It has the most amazing coastlines. On that coastline, one can find turtles, whales, amazing corals. Our seas teem with life, our natural environment, an incredible web of biodiversity. Through the coast, you will see so many different type of sand. Sometimes you'll see it's rock. Uh, there are so many rocks, and uh, sometimes you'll see it's uh, soft uh, sand. And then down in the south in Dofar, you have the annual monsoon which comes in. So it's about the only part of Arabia which really does turn green in the summer when the summer monsoons come in and they transform a barren, arid landscape into a lush, green part of Oman. It is just the most wonderful country. Young people born today are the first generation to be born with the knowledge and the tools to leave the world in a better place than they found it. Our place is a music place. There is a lot of uh, animals there and also the cross of the sea is we will not see in, in, in Muscat or in South in Oman. So yes, a good, good uh, place. Especially sunrise uh, and sunset, you will see a very beautiful place. You will notice that it's quiet. You can uh, just sit and uh, Feel the, the silence of the place and uh, listen to the silence. So starting on January the 6th, we will assemble on what is almost the most easterly point of the entire Arabic-speaking world, Ras al-Had. Ras al-Had is where the sun rises first over the entire Arabic-speaking world. This expedition will not only highlight Amman's rich biodiversity and natural heritage, but also symbolises the enduring friendship between our two countries. So, Jewel of Arabia. Was ever an expedition better named? I'm Mark Evans. I live in a beautiful little village in Scotland called Bewley, just to the west of Inverness. Um, but for the last 21 years of my life, I've been living in an equally beautiful part of the world called the Sultanate of Oman. And you know, you find your tribe, don't you? And you find what gives you contentment. And I just find Oman gives me just such great happiness, really. And uh, the Omani people are some of the kindest, friendliest, most openly welcoming people you will ever meet. It's just been a privilege to be able to call Oman my home for two decades of my life. Eight years ago, Two Omanis and I, we were fortunate to get all the permissions that we needed to retrace the first ever crossing of the biggest sand desert on earth, the Rubal Kali, or the empty quarter as we call it in the Western world. Um, and the, the person we followed was an, a little known Englishman called Bertram Thomas. And, and Thomas was different to all of the other Arabian explorers that we see as the great explorers, Thesiger and, and um, Philby. They were born into the colonial service. Thomas was, mother and father were very humble. Mother ran the post office in a little village called Pill, just behind Gordano service station on the M5. And uh, um, so he was born into a very humble background, but worked his way up. And he did his journey in 1930-31. So he worked through the heat of summer and saved his leave for the cooler winter months, which were better to travel. But it was a journey that he undertook in 1928 that increasingly caught my eye because that was the journey where he was really developing himself and develop, developing a mode of travel that would ultimately prove successful two years later when he did his big crossing across this great desert. And Jewel of Arabia expedition that will start in January 2025 and will take 30 days by on foot, by camel, with the support of a couple of um, four-wheel drive vehicles which will enable us to visit places of interest um, fairly close to the route that Thomas took in 1928. It, it'll start near to the most easterly point of the 
entire Arabic speaking world, a place just south of a place called Ras Al Had, where Oman points out and juts out towards India. And from there we will follow, I have Thomas's diary that he typed up, thankfully, um, after his journey in 1928. We'll use his diary and his black and white photographs to guide us along the coast. Following the coast from Ras Al Had to Salala, the second largest city in Oman, down near the border with Yemen. When I look at the route that Thomas took, I see that it connects a large number of Oman's top biodiversity hotspots ranging from huge numbers of turtles on the coast to humpback whales, the only non-migratory um, um, population of humpback whales in the world because the, the monsoon winds bring the cold and the hot water to the whales. They don't need to move from one to the other. We have stories to tell of frankincense, of, of green energy, green hydrogen, um, reed beds that have filtering water in the oil fields that, that, that have turned into a, an incredible um, oasis of greenery in, in an area of sand. There are so many stories to tell, not just of place and things, but of people who are, who are, who are now involved in carving out and shaping a sustainable future for Oman. So, so this is a great opportunity through the Jewel of Arabia with a fantastic team that we've got together to really put the spotlight on Oman and on its rich biodiversity and on the people that are immersed in that um, biodiversity and sustainable future. As the itinerary unfolds, Oman's precious treasure chest of biodiversity and rich natural heritage, the important role they play in sustaining life and the challenges they face will be placed firmly in the global spotlight. Um, my name is Azan Qasim al Saidi. I'm the Undersecretary of Ministry of Heritage and Tourism for Tourism. And along the way, the team will give the world an introduction to determine the young pioneers shaping a green and environmentally responsible future for Oman. And may I say, the immense significance of Jewel of Arabia is reflected in the fact that both His Royal Highness Sayyid Yazan bin Haytham al Said and His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales have graciously agreed to be its patrons. Your Royal Highnesses, we are honored to have your most valuable support. Your involvement will greatly increase the impact of this most meaningful project and initiative. This very much is a, 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 a British Omani project where you know the Bertram Thomas was a Brit but he was in the service of the Sultan of Oman so that so that 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 connection that partnership that historical friendship goes back many many years and hopefully the jewel of Arabia just continues that I'm Richard Stanford I chair the British Omani Society the British Omani Society exists to further connect and strengthen and deepen the connections between our two countries the relationship between Britain and Oman is somewhat unique for the whole of the Gulf. The first treaty was signed in 1643 between the East India Company and the port of Sohar. And over that time, Oman and Britain have supported one another in all sorts of ventures. The first formal country-to-country -country treaty was in the 1800s. And that had a, an expression within there which said that the relationship between our two countries should remain unshook to the end of time. A fantastic piece of history. One of the roles that I have as the privilege of being the chair of the British Omani Society is to say, how can we make that historical link relevant to people today? And we use an expression sometimes of being a good ancestor. We're looking after the relationship between our two countries and we're looking after the environment and the connection between people, environment, people and one another is really important. How can we be good ancestors? I had the real privilege to be in Oman and live in Oman for a number of years, and I'll never forget being in the middle of a very remote area called the Hukuf. And there I met a family of 12 brothers having coffee under a tree in the middle of nowhere. And I was uh, speaking to them in my very poor Arabic, but we then uh, they quickly worked out I wasn't a native speaker, which didn't take much. Um, and they said, where are you from? Oh, you're from Britain. 
and they knew about this relationship. People, nomadic people living in the middle of the desert knew about the strength of that relationship and that is really powerful. So one of our roles as the British Omani Society is to how we bring that meaning to people of Oman and of Britain. How do we connect these people? And what we can do today and what Mark is doing on this expedition with so many others supporting from both Britain and Oman is taking young people and showing them that beauty but also the effects of climate change, the effects on the amazing environment of Oman. And I've had the privilege of living there and seeing some absolutely fantastic sites. We've got to protect them. We've got to make sure that they will survive climate change. And part of what Mark is doing is bringing that to people's knowledge and understanding. And this expedition, the Jewel of Arabia, is just brilliant as a mechanism to connect young people from both countries. So the timing of the Jewel of Arabia expedition and the work we're doing, I, I think, is, is, is absolutely critical. You know, it wasn't too long ago that the, the first Omani won an Earthshot prize for carbon capture, taking carbon out of the air and injecting into rocks in Oman. There's a lot of great innovation going on. And, I, you know, I've lived in Oman for 20, 21 years. And when I first went there, there weren't so many Omanis involved in the environmental arena. But that, that's really changed now. And, you know, many years ago, I, I kayaked around the entire coastline of Oman. It was about 1,700 kilometres. And sometimes you don't appreciate what you've got until you haven't got it. And as a result of that journey, I went further north in the Arabian Gulf and I kayaked around Qatar and I kayaked around Bahrain. And it was only when I was kayaking further north that I realised that the sea there was, was pretty much dead. And I saw very little living things in the sea there. But when I... When I reflected on Oman and took my kayak onto the ocean in Oman, the sea is absolutely alive with tuna the size of dustbin lids, turtles, sea snakes, dolphins. It's incredible. Um, but like everywhere in the world, it's under increasing pressure due to development and human activity. And I think you know, the timing of, of the opportunity to do the Jewel of Arabia uh, and... Oman, like every country in the world, is trying to decarbonize its economy. Um, it's heavily dependent on oil and gas, but it, you know, His Majesty the Sultan has a vision to make Oman net zero in a couple of decades' time. Ecotourism and environmental adventurous tourism has a real role to play. And, and I think us putting the spotlight on Oman, for Oman, it's, it, that's a real asset that it has nationally that other countries in the region don't have. And I just think it's a real trump card. I can help Oman play to help diversify its economy and really put the spotlight on these, these environmental riches. Adventure tourism is uh, one of the uh, priorities right now in, uh, in tourism Oman as being a sector that uh, makes use and utilizes the, uh, uh, the amount of diversity we have uh, in Oman. So, uh, the, from mountains to beaches to deserts to uh, and all of this uh, uh, makes it possible that tourists uh, can enjoy uh, a number of activities related uh, to tourism. This is the first thing. The second thing is that um, it is as well the type of tourism that uh, makes a very limited, uh, uh, if I can call it harm or uh, changes to all of these uh, these areas and uh, we have seen a significant growth in tourism especially in, in adventure tourism especially young, among the younger uh, travelers who uh, following uh, the post uh, post pandemic uh, trends uh, we see them making more visits shorter but uh, in order to experience something uh, different and i think that oman has uh, plenty to offer when it comes to adventure tourism I think uh, having that a country in the Middle East picks up a global, uh, a matter of global interest uh, and creates this expedition just to tell the story to the rest of the world by itself is a strong promotional approach. Uh, it shows that Oman is connected to global uh, issues. Uh, it uh, can contribute positively as well 
uh, in this regard. And most importantly, the beauty that people are going to be seeing, uh, either sceneries or uh, the people themselves, uh, the, uh, everything related to our culture, hospitality, the diversity and authenticity of the tourism product in the country is something that I think will be, uh, will be uh, a unique selling proposition, if I could say. So the Jewel of Arabia, it, it, it is, you know, I, I spoke recently at the Royal Geographical Society about, about legacy and making sure that what you do makes and leaves a real difference. Uh, and, and so journeying with purpose is an oft used term these days. For, but for me, that, that it's all about slowness and immersing yourself in what's around you you know many of us have lost our, what 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 people like Barry Lopez call the native eye we, 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 in, our, in our modern busy lives we kind of miss what's around us but the opportunity we have on Jewel of Arabia you know we'll be traveling in silence almost every day all you'll hear will be the pad of the camels pads on the sand um, and you, you hear everything uh, you see everything, which you know the Bedouin. You spend time with the Bedouin. Incredible people. They're so in tune with their surroundings, and and that is what we will be when we're you know give us a couple of days, and we'll we will have we will have turned into Bedouin really and Bedouin travellers. So yet yeah, we have vehicles to carry water and and things like that, and enable us to travel from A to B if we need to cover ground to meet a really interesting person or visit particular location of interest just off Thomas's route but other than those vehicles you know it's going to be total silence immersion in that landscape simplicity uh, we will move every morning before the sun comes up before things get hot and we'll be in our sleeping bags uh, at probably eight o'clock every night um, shivering away under those beautiful desert stars so you know there are so many layers to what we're doing we have a great opportunity to tell stories and that's a key thing that we're doing on Jewel of Arabia and how do you do that today how does a modern day expedition tell stories and, and how do you share it with your audience well, so we'll be we'll be podcasting every day we'll be carrying some simple equipment but we also have um, a great super talented photographer called Anna Maria Pavalashi who'll be with us Anna Maria's worked with me in Oman before a great ability to tell stories through images. To do to make a story, you actually have to know about it. Um, so that's why the knowledge and to the research that you do before is very important. Um, but I think photography is important when you tell a story because, as we know, it values more um, than any other words uh, as been said. Um, but research for me it's very important to make a good storytelling and to really get people immersed into into the story so and sometimes apart from photography um, today we use more and more videos so can, so that can people through sounds and the images and still images can immerse into the environment even if they are in another corner of the world and not in Oman but they can experience Oman from their from their home, from their own home. Expeditions are nothing if they don't leave a lasting impact. If when we turn the social media off after 30 days, that's it, we failed in our mission. We want to leave a legacy that endures. And part of that is really inclusivity, which we mentioned before. Um, Suresh is in the room. Suresh runs a company called Equal Adventure. What you're looking at here is an electric all-terrain wheelchair. Uh, someone in the room has been testing this in the Cairngorm Mountains throughout the winter. It was flown out from Bryce Norton to Oman recently, thanks to the support of His Royal Highness uh, the Yazin. And now it's been reassembled and one stage of our journey we will be joined by young people, one of whom will be using Oman and the Middle East's first ever. So Oman is leading the way in uh, enabling young people with disability to engage in outdoor learning. Many years ago, thanks to the support of the Duke of Edinburgh and uh, His Majesty Sultan Qaboos, Outward Bound Oman was blessed with the support to open two national centres for outdoor learning. But there is now growing 
hope that we can open a third training centre in the south of Oman. And I know, Your Excellency, you've been very supportive of this. We've identified land. This would be in Dofar in southern Oman. But we don't just want it to be a centre for outward bound. We want to bolt onto it. Oman and the Middle East's first centre for biodiversity and sustainability. So many of the materials, the stories, the images that we capture on our journey, we hope will sit inside this uh, very important building that will showcase future Oman and innovative Oman. So Dikra and Ibrahim have got a critical role on our, on our expedition. A, what I'm communicating in English, they will communicate in Arabic, but it's their job to translate much of what we gather into Oman's first course for young people, focusing totally on sustainability and biodiversity. Outward Bound has already trained 28,000 young people, and I think we can shape the thinking of similar numbers going forward. And one nice thing about today is that I am able to announce something that we've been sitting on for several weeks. Um, in that Dikra was recently awarded and she became the first Omani to become a National Geographic Explorer, which is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. But with that title comes a huge responsibility. What she has to do with the, with the, with the grant that she's received is to translate all the materials that we gather on our journey into a meaningful youth course and train the trainers to deliver those courses. When we start our journey, it will be 2025. And 2025 is 225 years since a treaty of friendship was signed between Britain and Oman. And that treaty, there was a line in, line in it which said, unshook till the end of time. And I think the very fact that we are such, uh, we're so privileged to have um, the two Royal Highnesses with us today shows that that, that relationship is thriving uh, and, and has another at least 225 years to go, I hope. <laughs> so on that note, uh, if I may invite His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales to come up to the podium, please. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's great for me personally to be back at the Royal Geographical Society for the launch of the Jewel of Arabia expedition. I'm delighted to be joined by His Highness Saeed Hazen, and I've just had the opportunity to look through some of the images from the RGS collection, and they bring back warm memories of my visit to Oman in 2019. This expedition will not only highlight Oman's rich biodiversity and natural heritage, but also symbolizes the enduring friendship between our two countries. This was again demonstrated by the recent visit to the UK by His Majesty the Sultan of Oman. The expedition will walk in the footsteps of British explorer Bertram Thomas, taking in the wonderful coastline of Oman. They'll be able to see the beauty of Oman, but also the damage done by climate change. I'm delighted that one of the winners of the Earthshot Prize Awards last year, or actually it was in 2022, was from Oman. Uh, 4401 removes CO2 permanently by mineralizing it in peridotite, a rock found in abundance in Oman, as well as in America, Europe, Asia, and Australasia. I wish Mark and all the team the very best for your expedition. I wish I was able to join you, uh, but I'll be following it very closely. Thank you again, Your Highness, for joining us today, and good luck to everyone involved. Thank you, Royal Highness. May I invite uh, His Royal Highness Saeed the Yazin uh, bin Haytham. Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to Your Royal Highness uh, for joining me as patron for this cultural initiative. Your dedication to conservation and cross-cultural engagements resonates far beyond Britain's shores. And it is a pleasure to share a common goal with you, honouring the long-standing bilateral Omani British friendship. It brings me particular joy to acknowledge how our British friends have traced ancient Omani roots, expressing genuine interest and insight. The spirit of adventure and cross-cultural engagement exemplifies the very essence of our enduring relationship, which has been nurtured through generations of leadership and remains a cherished legacy that binds our countries together. Wishing the expedition teams the best of luck on the journey. Thank you very much. On the journey, we'll feel really closely connected to Bertram Thomas, A, because we'll be following the hand-drawn map that was constructed as a result of his notes and his field notes in his diary. Um, I have 
many of the old images that he took on that journey to try and position myself exactly where he stood all those years before. Um, I will carry with me, thanks to the team at Cambridge University, so when Thomas died, his wife put all of his documents and photographs in a trunk and donated them to Cambridge University. So there they've sat for years. And the team there very kindly, when they heard of the Jewel of Arabia project, let me know that they had, in fact, Bertram Thomas's 1928 diary, which I was slightly fearful of, of, of receiving because I thought it would be written in sort of copper plate, the copper plate handwriting of the time that I, I sometimes find quite difficult to read. But actually, he clearly used the hot summer months that followed that 1928 journey to type everything up, which is great. So I will be carrying a copy of Thomas's 1928 diary, and my hope is that the team and I can, when we sit around the fire at night, when we've done our six or eight hours of travelling every day and we've met the people that we're, we want to podcast and interview and, and listen to, that we can sit down and gather our thoughts and just, just read... Uh, around that fire, under that incredible starry sky, um, the, the 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 section of the diary that that covered that particular area that we travel through today. But but another thing that I've also got is um, is Thomas's notes from when he lectured at the Royal Geographical Society, and he lectured at the Society on the third of December in nineteen twenty eight, and uh, and the title of his of his lecture was called "The Southeast Borderlands of the Rubalkali or the Empty Quarter." I just like the way that he introduced it. In it, he he said the area in which he was hoping to travel was a vast unknown region of three hundred thousand square miles of probably uninhabited scorching sand and arid steppe that is a name of terror throughout Arabia. And he said, Oman, cut off from the west and north by this great wedge of desert, receives scant attention from the classic geographers. And if we know little of the rest of the continent, here we know even less. The map of southeastern Arabia was of necessity blank, and my journey through the southern borderlands of the great desert was undertaken to partly fill these empty spaces on the map. So I think that sets the scene beautifully as to why he did his journey and as a result of his journey a map was drawn um, and we will be using interestingly a digital map now online that school children halfway around the world are able to follow us and join us around the fireplace every night so I think there's a real thread of maps through all that. What am I lo most looking forward to? I am... Um, <laughs> the thing I'm looking forward to the most, because there's so much work goes into getting an expedition like this off the ground, and the closer the clock gets to midnight, the more frenetic it becomes, because you have deadlines of launches of website launches um, and all sorts of things so the thing I am looking forward to the most is getting into my sleeping bag on day one because then I know we're on our way and I can't do any more that simplicity of slow travel that immersion in 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 the environment um, that's what I'm looking forward to the most because as soon as we get to day one that's when it all begins and I know when I wake up the first morning I'll hear the desert lark calling out of the darkness and I'll see the sun rising and uh, I'll hear the camels teeth squeaking away as they're grinding their food all night and uh, you know the sounds of my normal life in Scotland will be replaced by the sounds of the desert and uh, that's what I'm looking forward to the most.